we're going to highlight a particular trip to Colombia, which is why I'm joined by my colleague Juan Orjuela, who's actually in Bogota right now. Uh, hey, Juan. We, do, we just talked recently, but we get to, get to see each other in the nighttime too. Um, yeah, so I'll talk a little bit about just the travel in general. We'll, we'll focus in on the particular uh, trip we do in, in Colombia um, as a way to kind of understand, uh, I think, one of the best examples of, of where justice travel works in the world. And then basically open up to questions people have, uh, either specific or general, and we can kind of take the discussion from there. Um, yeah, so a little bit like Greta was saying, justice travel was really fine with the idea that we can bridge tourism and human rights in a way that will both uh, support the work of grassroots advocacy organizations in the global north, in places like US, Canada, Europe, um, and as well directly support the work of, of human rights activists in countries around the world, um, most of the time under you know, very, very challenging circumstances. Um, so I really, uh, you know, thinking about uh, countries in which people are visiting quite regularly and um, where there are significant human rights challenges, and yet most of the time the world of, of travel and the world of human rights are kept entirely separate. Um, people, even people who have an interest in learning more about the political, social realities on the ground, and um, what they get to see is, you know, a nice beach. Uh, maybe they get a chance to to learn a little bit about some NGOs doing work in the country. And um, but some of the frontline uh, human rights activists and dealing with the most challenging issues are usually kept quite quite apart from from that world. So what Justice Trouble does is bring those two together. And um, so we work with certain two types of ways. Uh, on the one side, with public programs. So we basically have a tour that we schedule. And anyone who wants to sign up can, can sign up. Those tours range. Uh, we have tours right now in Colombia, which are just one day long. So people who have planned out maybe a longer trip um, and like to you know, learn a little bit, little bit about the country while they're there. And we have one and two day trips. And we also have much longer trips. So like in uh, what we have about three weeks one for the first trip. Yeah, so in, oh, sorry, one's going to do two. Um, so in about three weeks, we have our first extended trip going to, going to Colombia, which will be 14 days. And um, we have people coming from, I think this trip is just the US and, and UK. Um, and it's a small trip as we kind of get started. We also have another trip going to Colombia in, in November, which is a bit larger one of university students coming from Norway. Uh, so just to travel, kind of, we bridge a lot of different types of audiences. But the idea really is that either we have public trip that people are coming to that's open, or we have a trip that's the, particularly for a specific group. So it could be university, it could be religious group, could be... Uh, NGO could be members of a different organization um, that want to learn a little bit about human rights work around the world and particularly with an you know, immersive travel experience. Um, that's kind of our, our founding. Uh, I'll come back a little bit to our uh, founding pieces I share presentation. I'm realizing also that we have a number of people on the phone, so I won't focus so much on visual aspects. Um, I will have a presentation that I'll share so you guys can see it as this is recorded so you would get to see it later. Um, but I'll sort of talk through everything as we, as we go along. And please, um, I think everybody's muted, but you should have the ability to raise your hand, at least if you're looking on the computer. So if you have a question as I'm, as I'm going through, um, when you open the participants side of the webinar, there's a little button at the bottom that says raise hand. So if you have a question as I'm going along, just raise your hand and I'll stop and we can, we can talk more about it. Um, um, yeah, Gabriel, I was thinking that maybe people could raise their hands and we could take all the questions at the end and we can see the queue of all the hands raised. Um, also, if you're on the computer, you can enter your questions in the chat box as well. If you're on the phone, the way to raise your hand is to press star six. Uh, okay. Excellent. Yeah, no, no problem. No problem. Okay. So I'm going to share my screen and open up a little short presentation that talks a little more about justice travel and our, our trip in Colombia. Let me, oh, I wonder if I can, actually I don't see the option to share. Uh, hold it. Okay. Okay, so there you should be able to see the shared screen now. Is, that, is it up there, Greta? Yes, it is. Thanks. Perfect. So, Justice Travel. Uh, a little bit about our background. Um, so our mission, Mission Justice Travel, is to build a global community of travelers and advocates engaged together to defend human rights around the world. Um, and in order to fulfill that mission, we work with partners around the world, groups in countries of the global north, like the World Beyond War, um, a number of partners in every country we work in who are on the ground, human rights work, um, in Colombia right now, in Guatemala, and in Mexico, uh, and looking at a few more countries in the next couple of, 
next six months to a year that we are we're looking to expand into. So core principles, there's really four of them. Uh, first one, our partners at the center. Everything we do really revolves around the work of our partner organizations. Um, their priorities, their needs, their interests, their comfort, their comfort level with bringing people into the work, which is often quite sensitive. Um, that's at the middle of, of our, our trip planning. It's the middle of, of our uh, impact really over a long period of time. Uh, second phase is people for politics. Um, often these are complex issues which have, which have a political side to them. Um, Justice Travel's work is not meant to advance a particular ideology or a political party. We really look at human rights as being universal. So it doesn't matter left, right, middle, you are entitled to, to human rights. Um, third piece, and this is hugely important for our trips, as you might imagine, safety first. Uh, we work in, comp in countries which are sometimes complex, sometimes uh, unpredictable. Uh, we do thorough safety vetting of all of our activities. We are working with our partners constantly to reassess risk. If there's areas of the country that we're not comfortable going to, then activities change. Um, and sometimes that happens even while we're on the tours, we might decide, okay, we need to do a, one thing or different thing just based on things that happened recently. Um, that's, yeah, and that's crucial. And it's honestly, it's not just for travelers, but also for our partners. They're often times at risk because of the stances they're taking. Um, in country, so it's important that as travelers we respect their need for some level of control over what it is that people are doing when they're when they're in country. Um, so that, that comes both the pre orientation process throughout the trip, and um, that we're you know, making people aware of, of sensitivity of issues sometimes that, as an outsider, you might not always be be familiar with. Um, and last thing that's obviously crucial to to us as an, as a company, impact over profit. Uh, we're a for profit because that allows us to have the greatest impact for our partners. Um, our goal is not to become a large tour operator. Our goal is not to become uh, some sort of you know, multinational enterprise. Uh, the, the essence of Just a Travel, and this is written into our legal registration documents as well, is to exactly what it was laid out in our mission. Um, it's to build that global community of travelers and advocates and to work for, uh, for our partners in country to see their missions realized. So those are our four core principles. Um, that is laid obviously in looks different in different countries. Different countries can have different priorities and issues that we want to focus on. Uh, and what we're going to look at today is the case of Colombia. Um, so for those of you who can see, you can read a little bit more on this screen. Um, this describes our long trip in Colombia, the first of which is, is taking place in, in just a few weeks, um, which really looks at a broad spectrum of, of issues in Colombia, of partners and of geographies, so traveling in different parts of the country. Um, the, the essential narrative uh, that we really focus on in Colombia is going over the peace process. Uh, so looking at very briefly at the overall map of the country, uh, during this trip, we go, we started in Bogota and traveling, uh, spending a few days in Bogota as well as uh, traveling for one day outside the capital to uh, a small village called Icononso. And I'll come back to that in a second, why that's a really important place um, along this trip. Uh, the second leg of the trip is in Cali, which is a city in the southwest of the country. Um, particularly there, the focus is on indigenous and Afro-Colombian groups that are living in the Pacific and, and the Cauca region of the country there. Um, after that, the next leg is to Medellin, a uh, beautiful city, a city which has changed a lot in, in recent times, moving from you know, kind of bad days of Pablo Escobar and, and drug trafficking to now one of the most innovative cities in the world, a place where... A lot of tech companies are starting, people are relocating there as expats, a um, really fascinating place. Um, and just add, um, there, the, the focus is really on, on people who have been displaced from the years of fighting in Colombia to Medellin and to the areas around the city. Uh, leg after that, we travel from the mountains of the country to the coast, to uh, Santa Marta on the north coast. Um, just around there, it's both an incredibly beautiful location um, on the beach, we'll have a look at that in a second, uh, as well as places and we work with a group called Camara Oscura, uh, which are basically a young uh, cooperative uh, that, that, create, that do creative works of different kinds. And particularly for them, our focus is on the indigenous community, the YU, who live in the mountains outside of, of Santa Marta. Um, and it's both a kind of a cultural appropriation of, of the work of the, sorry, kind of the history and, and uh, legacy of, of these groups, as well as uh, their desire to tech, protect their land and, and natural resources in the, in the area. Um, the last leg of the trip where we end is in, in Cartagena, a um, beautiful historic city. Uh, you might know it from the, what was the, the famous novel Juan by Gabriel Garcia Marquez? I think it was Love in the Time of Colorado. No? That was the, yeah, that was the, 
set in, in, in Cartagena. Um, you know, a very visited tourist destination. I think the interesting thing about Cartagena, besides for being a beautiful place to visit, is that it's a really, it's a place of extreme inequality. So you have a really wealthy area of Cartagena where tourists will go, where people, Colombian people will, will live in kind of very fancy apartments, uh, you know, kind of the highest end of luxury. And just outside the city are some really destitute areas, particularly where people have been displaced um, in what is essentially internal refugee camps uh, for the country. And they're existing side by side in the city. So it's an interesting place, I think, to see that side of Colombia that has both this very modern face, but still so many uh, social problems that have not been resolved, um, even as the peace process advances. So I want to just look briefly over each of these stops, and then I'll come back and we can, we can talk a bit more. Um, the idea of using, I think, Colombia for this, both because we have ongoing programs there, so people who are interested in traveling to Colombia, you have this opportunity to, to go. Um, but I think it also illustrates the way that justice travel works um, and why we feel like our model is so powerful in considering the impact for our, for our partners. Um, so again, here's the overall narrative that's focused on the peace process. So for those of you who are watching here, um, this is a picture of the signing of the peace process, the signing of the peace accords uh, between the FARC uh, rebels, which is the sort of sh somewhat shorter man uh, to the right, uh, which is his name is Timochenko, he's the leader of the, the FARC rebel group. Um, and the guy who's actually signing there is Juan Manuel Santos, who is still the president of Colombia for another few weeks. Um, he had just, a new successor has been elected now. Um, and just to the left of, of him, you can see Ban Ki-moon, the UN Secretary General. This was an important time for Colombia. Um, I think really, the, obviously people who are going there, we get much more into depth about the history and the current context. But I think the important thing to know is that the situation there right now, and Juan can, can speak a bit more about this, obviously, in, in, in depth. Um, it's one of hope that there's an ex expectation that things could improve based on the framework set forth in this peace accord and you know, decades of violence in the country, but yet it's still unrealized uh, opportunity. You know, some of the pieces of the peace accord have not been implemented, some of them have been implemented, but not very firmly. Um, so some of the social issues which, were the, which had brought about the conflict to begin with have not still been addressed, particularly when it comes to land, uh, marginalized groups, indigenous and Afro-Colombian groups, and so there's kind of a, two sides of the same coin, both hope on the one side, but a reality on the other side, which is, um, which in some ways has not improved in, in, in other ways in the last year or so has actually gotten more challenging in certain parts of the country. Violence has, has focused on, on social leaders that, that have been uh, trying to lead a kind of transformation in their, their, their localities. So this is the, the broad narrative for the, for the country. Um, quick trip visually, this is a picture of uh, Bolivar Square in, in Bogota. That's where we start the tour. Um, really to give a context for the country, starting in the capital, um, meeting groups that are working there, having trip, uh, sort of walking tours around the capital city. Um, you have a lot of history there. You have some beautiful museums. Um, we have some interesting people who come to give some, some talks, people who are former government ministers and, and journalists in the country, um, really for, for people who are traveling the trips to understand mm -hmm. not just the you know, very simple aspects of Colombia, not the Wikipedia page aspect of Colombia, but really to get, get much more in depth. Uh, from there, uh, I mentioned before the trip to Icononzo. And Icononzo is uh, by itself not a particularly important place in the history of Colombia, but it has become important in the current context because this is where, this is one of the, I believe it's 19 places, one? 19, yeah, um, where the former FARC rebels who demobilized to, to rejoin society have been living. Um, for almost a year now, I guess. Um, and so it's a place where kind of the rubber meets the road of the peace process. How successful is it that, that Colombia can really reintegrate um, these former fighters into society? How can it make sure that people who suffer during the conflict feel that their voices are being heard, even though perhaps they were the one that had suffered at the hands of the FARC? And at the same time, how can the former FARC fighters themselves, young people often who have not known anything except for, for warfare, and really rejoin society, so have jobs, reconnect with their families. And um, this is just a picture of, of one of them, I guess, planting a, I'm not sure what kind of tree that is, but some kind of tree nuts. You, know, you, took, the, you took this picture, Juan, no? Yeah, it is an avocado. Ah, okay. Tree. Yeah, that's perfect then, that's perfect. Um, yeah, so it's, it's a really fascinating stop, and honestly, it's also quite a unique uh, thing. Most people who visit the country, most Colombians even, don't get a chance to interact with, with former FARC fighters. Um, to really understand 
not the peace process from this you know, 20,000 foot view, but right up front, what does it mean to really be a part of, the, of this process um, of national reconciliation, of healing? Um, it's really a, a moving time. Um, I'm honestly looking forward myself to go and, and visit this, this piece of the, the trip. And so after Bogota, like I said, we go to Cali. Um, Cali has some beautiful places in, in the city itself, but for me, the most, most important part of that, that trip are the visits with our two partners outside of Cali. And one of which you have a picture of here, which is um, a group called Asin, uh, which is the translation in English, like the indigenous leaders, essentially, of the Northern Cauca region, um, which is just the south of Cali. And um, they have, this region has seen some of the worst fighting during the war. Um, and the indigenous people, I would say, there have been both politically marginalized and directly suffered uh, on behalf, uh, as a result of, of some of this violence. And so the move now to kind of to reconquer both their own territory, to have a sort of level of autonomy and, and voice in, in decisions made about the resources that are there, about the security forces that are in the area, um, it's hugely important. So th these people are, are doing an incredible job there and, and in place which, has, which is really challenging to work. So they are, for us, I think, a quite an important partner. And we get a chance to, to sit and talk with them and to learn a bit about the history of, of their, their work, as well as what they want to see happen, uh, kind of transformation, social, cultural, economic um, empowerment for, for indigenous uh, tribes in, the, in that, uh, that part of the, the country. Um, the other side, and not pictured, is a, is a group called Afrodes, um, which is the Association of Displaced Afro-Colombian Communities. Um, they are based around the country, but there are a lot in the Pacific region, so in the sort of western to the west of, of Cali. Uh, and again, this is a group that suffered tremendously during the conflict. Um, they had already been greatly marginalized, um, both economically and, and socially, um, and now uh, similar, in, in, similar in ways and, and oftentimes working together with indigenous groups in the country to, to have a, yeah, I mean, a transformation, I think, is, is really the, the right word to use, uh, both of the country and the way, the role that the, both these groups have to play. Um, and then just opportunities for, for young people there to go to school, to have jobs, um, to have, you know, place to, to live and work, which is safe. Again, uh, you know, these, are, these are things that they are, they're still having to fight for, even, there, even as the peace process is moving forward. Um, so it's a really, I think, besides for Cali City, which is interesting in itself, these two groups there, it's a really, um, yeah, it's a, it's a powerful point because they have, they have been working such, for such a long time. Um, and you know, remain kind of in this, in this challenging situation. Uh, moving on from Cali, the next stop is in Medellin. So Medellin, this is just a picture, see a little bit of the cityscape and the, um, the cable car, which is over the city, quite famous cable car um, there, which uh, we will chance to tour around Medellin itself uh, with the University of Antioquia, which is the, the state around Medellin. Um, there are some researchers there who are doing uh, basically like community-based research projects in the city particularly in areas where uh, people who were displaced during the conflict have moved to Medellin and, and are uh, to some extent in a better and worse situation in, in the city. Um, so a chance really to, to understand Medellin, not just from the, the tourist perspective, because there are some beautiful museums there. And in a second, I'll show you one that we'll go to visit. Um, but also to get to know Medellin as people are really living it, uh, people who, uh, who make up a, a huge amount of the city. You can see sort of, the city itself lies in the bottom of this valley. Um, and then all up along the sides of the valley are these more, not quite informal areas, but uh, less formal settlements uh, in what they call comunas, uh, different neighborhoods around the city. Um, so one of the places we go to visit, and this is just a one exhibit in the, that place, is the Museum of the House of Memory, I guess that's what you translate it. Um, it's an incredible place. Um, they, are, they do a lot of activities as well as being a museum themselves, um, but it's really a place for people to memorialize the, the, both the pain and the, the, the suffering that happened during so many decades of, of conflict, but also to put on, I would say, a, a hopeful face, maybe, I don't know if you agree, Juan, for the future, to say, like, we have had all these terrible things happen, but now we are building ourselves for the future, and we can, we can remember it in a, you know, in a safe way. I think that's that's important that, that, that kind of we not just brush aside the past and say okay time to forget it but really to to have a have a place particularly in Medellin which had so much so many painful years um, a place to yeah to, to memorialize things which have happened here this is just a, a plate you see um, I'm not even sure do you, Juan do you remember what what this plate is um, what it's meant to be showing 
this exhibit? Yeah, this plate is showing a group of displaced people and how, and I guess my interpretation is that it, it is bro broken because it shows how displacement destroys your life, you know, and how it changes your lifestyle, your livelihood. So I think that's what they're trying to show with this plate. Yeah. Do you remember the, I can't remember the statistics now. At, at some point, Colombia had the most displaced people in the world, or maybe second most, just second to Syria. Right now, we are the first country with more displaced internal people. Yeah. Which is, I mean, it's incredible. You think about the situation now, it's not, the violence is nothing compared to a place like Syria, but yet there are still millions of people around the country who they're not living in their homes. Uh, they, some of them may never go back. Some of them may want to go back, but they still haven't figured out how to. Um, so that kind of healing process, maybe the, the broken plate of like, people who are separated from their, their homes where, uh, where, their, where their families came from. So, and that's a big issue right now because Right now, it's not just the internal displaced people, but also people coming from Venezuela. Just in the past year, we got over a, a million Venezuelans coming into Colombia. So right now, that's one of the biggest debates in the country because it, dep it, it, it demands from the government providing health and different services that, you know, it's very hard to provide from the point of view of the capacity of the system. Mm. Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a serious challenge. And just coming on, on the end of a peace process, which is still quite fragile to have this influx of, of really, I mean, refugees from Venezuela, essentially, even if they're not claiming refugee status. Um, yeah, it's, it's a real challenge, particularly in those eastern parts of the country. But I guess in Bogota as well, you have a lot of people who have, who have come. Um, yeah, it's one thing I think we are, we're kind of looking at this as, as an issue to, to highlight on future tours in Colombia. Right now, it's not the main focus, but considering how protracted this crisis seems to be, um, it becomes kind of a, a primary human rights issue within, within Colombia. Um, yeah. Anyway, so talking just a little bit about Medellin and the, the piece we go to there. After Medellin, we go from, from the mountains to the coast. Um, so... The coast, the Caribbean coast of Colombia is a beautiful place. It's just one picture of a, a part in, in a place called Tyrona Park, um, where, where we go and, and spend the day. Um, it's a, yeah, it's a, it's a magical part of the country, really incredible coastal mountains, uh, wildlife, everything. Um, but it's also, I think, important to remember, and this is part with our, our partnership with, with Camaro Oscura and uh, the YU indigenous uh, groups there, is that it's still a place where human rights are under threat. Um, you know, it, it's easy to see just the beauty and, and forget about the, the major issues, but you have uh, mining companies who have been uh, trying to increase their, their scope in that area um, and, and fights back and forth between indigenous groups and, and mining companies about uh, the rights to, to extract resources uh, um, from the, mostly from the mountains that are just, just uh, inland from the coast in, in the Sierra Nevada. And um, so this, the, this part of the trip is a bit of a, uh, to, again, there's two phases. So we have, you know, one day, which is really uh, a bit of a time to, to reflect on the trip and to spend time in really a naturally beautiful place. Um, but as well to, to spend time with, with Camaro Oscura and learn a bit more about uh, the realities that, that are behind the, the beauty in, in the, on the Caribbean coast. And so after Santa Marta, we go uh, just down the coast to Cartagena. Um, I was talking a little bit more about the inequalities before, so I won't go back into that. But it's, yeah, it's, you can, this is a picture here of one of the streets in, in Catalan. It's a beautiful historic city. Um, as we kind of come to the end of the trip, it's also a moment for us to, uh, to as a group who, who's traveling there, to come together and, and reflect a bit more about uh, what we have seen during the trip, to understand um, both some of the more difficult aspects, because some of the stories you might hear from, from people, from our partners, uh, might be challenging to, to understand, you know, the, the human... I think side of content. It's one thing to read about it in the newspaper or watch a TV show. You can watch Narcos and learn about this history of Colombia, but to talk with people who, who that was their real life experience, um, it's really, uh, it's, a, it's a very powerful and sometimes really difficult uh, emotions to, to deal with. So that's what's one piece of what, what we try to do as we come to a close in the trip. Um, 
but also really to, for people to understand what their role could be in these stories. Um, so the idea is not to relate just as an observer and to go home and say, okay, I have some pictures and some souvenirs, um, but really to be engaged in advocacy, particularly those who are coming back to the U.S. Um, around Colombia, because the influence of the U.S. government in Colombia is quite strong. Uh, and as it comes to the peace process, as it comes to security strategies, as it comes to support for social leaders who are often under threat, um, it's important that there is more and more voice from, from citizens in the U.S., from, from average citizens. And I say U.S., I mean, it's not to exclude Canadian and European governments, um, just to highlight that the U.S. has a particularly strong role uh, there, um, but that citizens come back to their elected officials. Um, so some of what we do is, is try to collaborate and, and organize lobbying as well, people who have returned. Um, it's important, that I think, that, that people hear particularly for those who have just traveled to Colombia, about realities on the ground, having talked with social leaders, human rights activists, um, to understand that there are still challenges which remain. That this is not a time to sit back and say, oh, well, this process was signed, and so now we have no more, no more work to do. Everything is solved, and it's far from, far from reality. Um, so that, I think, encapsulates more or less what I want to talk about when it comes to Colombia. So I'll kind of close and, and leave the last screen up for a second. Um, Gabriel, maybe 10 yeah, more yeah. minutes and then open up to Q&A. Yes, I mean, that, that was sort of where I wanted to get to with, with Colombia. Um, just to kind of go back a bit and talk about the model of justice travel. And I'll pop myself back to, uh, you can see my, my, uh, my face again, which is, I'm sure, such a, such a, such a treat for everyone. Um, I think we have, something we have, excellent. Sorry, I wasn't able to see participants as we were going along. Um, yeah, so this, I think, illustrates a, a good amount of what Justice Travel tries to do, which is really to blend a travel experience which is unique and engaging um, with uh, a real practical and, and personal connection with social leaders and human rights activists, uh, including journalists uh, um, who are working on some of the more challenging issues in the countries that we're visiting. So this was Colombia. I think it's a, it's a good example of that. And we have also programs in Mexico and Guatemala right now. Um, not too distant future, we'll have as well in Brazil, in South Africa, and Sri Lanka, um, with a sort of similar focus. The narratives shift from different countries, and what the idea is, is quite, uh, quite similar. So I think the one thing that I, I want to emphasize about the way Justice Travel works is that our goal, uh, our impact goal, is really along two lines. So on the one side, um, we want people to engage, to have awareness raised about these issues but also to go home afterwards and really to be involved in advocacy. Um, some, some people that may mean uh, a real high level of engagement. So going on lobbying visits um, helping to write letter writing campaigns, having to organize things in their, in their local areas. Again, in concert with other groups that focus on Colombia and Latin American advocacy, um, but at quite a higher level. But we have at least a minimum expectation that people go back and talk to, either talk to people that are in their immediate circles. So go back and maybe present to their church group or to their book club um, about what they, what they experience in Colombia, uh, write a letter to the local newspaper, um, join sometimes uh, if you're you know, in a, uh, an area where there's already ongoing advocacy groups, joining one of these groups and helping support the things that they are doing. And that's an important piece. Uh, I think that's part of the, what we see as really being owed to our human rights partners in country, that people come not just to learn and to have a good time, but to go back and to really be part of this large networks of advocacy um, that are essential for some of these groups, especially in the climate we have these days, where um, it's easy, easy to talk about the U.S., but it's not the only country where commitment to uh, supporting human rights work around the world is, is on decline uh, from, from major countries. Um, and so it really falls to citizens to fill that gap, uh, to really be voices for, for some of these groups. And otherwise, there's a lot of things they can do. They're incredible people, inspiring stories, but they can't reach the same audiences that travelers can reach. That's one really important piece of our work. And the other side is, is much more practical. Um, so it's a financial support. Uh, Greta was mentioning that we, we, do, we support partners in countries where tourists are coming from, but also 30% of the profits on every trip is, directed, is directly for our human rights partners on the ground to support their work. So anyone who's coming on a justice travel trip, you are essentially supporting these groups as well. And that's a, that's a big piece of it. So it's not just a, you know, small change donation to or the time they're giving us, but really a, a profit sharing partnership with those groups as well. And um, so they are bought into the idea of bringing people there. They see it as both beneficial to their advocacy work as well as with their, their direct operations. And most of these groups, um, you know, 
we do sometimes work with large organizations in the country and sort of advisory level, but the groups that we work with uh, on the ground, they're mostly small groups and they don't have access to international funding. They don't have um, a lot of support. So even the amount of money we can provide through the profit sharing mechanism allows them to do work that they wouldn't be able to do otherwise um, and gives them, yeah, I think support in, at that financial level, which it's, yeah, you don't have the same level of uh, philanthropy available that you might have to a grassroots group in the US or in Canada or in Europe. Um, so that's, those are both crucial aspects of what, what, what Just a Travel uh, model really looks like in different countries. Um, I think that kind of covers, yeah, the basic uh, piece of, of Just a Travel. I'm happy to take questions from people you know, specifically about Colombia and Juan is here and can answer in much more depth than I could about, about the situation there um, or about Just a Travel in general or anything else that's come to your mind as I was talking. Um, so everyone is muted, and if you want to ask a question, you can either type it into the chat box, or you can raise your hand, which if you're on the phone calling in, if you press star six, then that will raise their hand, raise your hand for me and I can unmute you. And if you're on the computer, if you click participants, you'll see a little hand that you can click. Okay, we have a question coming from Joyce. She asks, did you talk about how much the trip costs and what are the exact dates? I did not. So the, the, that depends. We have different trips that are running um, at different times of year. So the, the trip we have, which is leaving in three weeks now to Colombia, which actually you could still join, but it's be a bit, bit of a rush, but I'm, we're happy to have, have more people. Um, the trip costs, Three thousand five hundred and fifty dollars. Uh, not in, that's for a shared accommodation, um, and not including international airfare. And um, so that's the, those are the long trips. Right? This is a fourteen day trip. The one and two day trips are obviously much less expensive. How much is the, the one day trip one in, in Bogota? It's I think sixty dollars. Sixty dollars. Yeah, from there, it's a bit more expensive, but that's the average price of one of those short trips. And again, that, 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 that builds in the donation to, the, to our partner groups. So that 3000 that includes accommodation, um, all aspects of the tour and meals, or can you give yeah, us a yeah. breakdown a little bit? Of what yeah, it yeah. The, full, the full cost covers basically everything except for international flights. So all the flights and transportation around the country, all the accommodation, and a good amount of the meals. Some of the meals you still pay for yourself, but all the breakfasts are taken care of. And some of the lunches and dinners are included as well. Um, and the place we go in Colombia where we eat and you pay for it, it's not very expensive. So you're talking about maybe $10 at most for, for a meal. Um, but everything else is included. That includes guide. Um, yeah, the only, sorry, the only two things which are, uh, that you have to cover yourself would be international airfare and travel insurance. Those are the only two things which are not included in the, in the price. And can you just review some of the dates? I, I know there's a trip coming up in October, right? We have, yes. Yeah. So there, there's, a, there's a public trip which is available to, uh, we had put available in October. And right now, the main trips we have is the, the August trip and then November, which is a custom trip that's already set up. Um, I think there are, yeah, there are, there are options for people who want to come by themselves. Uh, I would love, of course, if there was interest from various people in World Beyond War that we have a number of people coming together in a, in a trip um, because then we can, we can make a date which is basically appropriate for, for people who are coming as opposed to having to fix the, the place that you are, to fix the date that you are intending to arrive. And if people want to sign up, how can they sign up? Uh, for public trips, you can always sign up on our website. Um, we have, you can, you can purchase a trip, you can put your deposit in for the trip on a website or you can send an email to either myself or Juan and say what you're interested in and we can, we can sign you up that way. Can you just say your email and your website for everyone so they can write it down? Yeah, I'll, send, actually, I can, I'll put it in the chat as well as I'm, as I'm saying it. So our website is quite simple. It's just justice.travel. And my email is gabriel at justice.travel. And you can write to Juan at Juan at justice.travel. Pretty simple to remember. 
So that's justice.travel. Oh, sorry, sorry I, I meant to be typing that publicly. End up being not a public. Hold on. I don't see any hands raised. If you want to ask a question, raise your hand. If you're on the telephone, you can press star six. And if you're on the computer, you can click on the word participants and then click on the little picture of a hand. And Gabriel, can you talk about how people can indicate that they heard about this through World Beyond War so that World Beyond War also um, gets a little bit uh, of sharing in the profits? Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's an important piece. So um, anyone who's coming to us through World Beyond War um, should do, do one of two things. So when you, if you buy a trip on the website, you'll have a point, a place to put in a, a code. Um, just type in there World Beyond War. It will recognize it regardless. You should, the, the technical one is just World Beyond War, all in one word, but it's okay if they're separate words. Either way, it will count. Or if you're sending us an email, just mention the email that it was through World Beyond War that you learned about justice travel. Um, and either way, we've done war get a percentage of the, of the price that you're paying for the tour as a donation to, to the organization. And so to clarify on what you were talking about earlier, people can organize their own trip, like if we wanted to do a World Beyond War specific trip with our members, or they can go on the website and view those existing trips that you were talking about, such as the one in October and other ones that are, are there throughout the website. Yeah, exactly, exactly. I think it's, it's, a, it's a useful thing, I think, for, for organizations that have a group of people that want to travel together because it's a time of both them, themselves learning on, on the trip as they're going through and also community building for people who are paying for it. That's always appreciated. Um, but yeah, anyone who, as an individual, can also go and sign up for our trips whenever they'd like to. If someone's already planning a trip to one of the countries we're working in or is looking to in the future, um, all those are available online. And we'll have more up for 2019 um, fairly soon. So if you're interested in 2019 trips, for the time being, just send us an email, and we'll have those trips up for public purchase soon. Looks like someone was, was trying to talk into the phone. I'm not sure. Yeah, I saw yeah. that. Um, was someone trying to ask a question? My name, my name is Vivian, and I'm new to this. But I'm wondering if this is educational in its intent or if there is service to be given um, to the countries that are visited. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much for that. Um, so I would say it's both. Uh, it's certainly educational in the sense that we're trying to raise people's awareness about the situation in Colombia as it was, relates to our partner organizations, as well as the general context for human rights in the country, uh, in the case of Colombia and of course other countries for themselves. Uh, and service, not so much uh, in a traditional volunteering kind of trip, but service in the sense that we expect people to go home afterwards and to work on behalf of our partners to raise awareness of their work in their own countries. Um, so you're not going uh, to, you know, to paint a school or, or to do something when you're in country. And um, for us, really, the, the biggest place that our travelers have um, sort of most effective use on, on, be, on behalf of our partners is really once they, once they come home. And that's where we work, both organizations like World Beyond War and others who do Latin America-focused advocacy uh, to help people get involved in their own, both in, the, I mean, their own local, like in their very, very local communities, as well as in the country in general. So if you're coming back to the U.S., or to Canada, and what you can do there as a, as a citizen, essentially, to, to act as a, a mouthpiece, I would say, for, for our partners who, who work on the ground. Thank you. That helps. Sure. Other questions? Other questions? Either about, about justice travel or about Colombia. And we have an expert here on, on, the, on the line, so... Um, if you have questions to just, just about Colombia's situation, which is quite, I mean, if you've been following the news recently, there's been a lot of um, interesting things, even besides for World Cup related just news, a lot of interesting things in, in Colombia recently. Yeah, Juan, did you want to say any, any words about the trip and your experience? And maybe you could just chime in. Well, 
Colombia is an eventful country and it's crazy how many things are happening every single day. You know, every single day you feel that we're about to see something big happening. Uh, we are having the inauguration for a new government three weeks from now. It's one of the youngest presidents we'll have in our whole history. And even though he's right wing, there are many reasons to be optimistic about how the peace process is going to keep on moving and how it's going to keep on changing the lives of all these communities that have been affected by the conflict. Um, and I personally believe that tourism and travelers are very important for changing the mindset of Colombians. When you visit communities, you see and they always exp express how, how happy, that they're very happy about receiving foreigners and, coming, and people coming from abroad because this country and some places such as Medellin ha have been stigmatized for many years and you feel and you see how people are actually very happy to see people coming and showing their interest in all these places that for many years were out of the touristic uh, path. So for us, it's very important uh, having this opportunity to build and create networks with people from other countries because I think that the government that we're going to have now, they won't be so active in the dialogue with activists and with human rights defenders. So I think that one channel that we could create is having all these partners and allies around the world the, the globe so they can speak in, on behalf of all these people that I think that in the next four years are going to have kind of a hard time to have as much space as they had during the negotiation of the peace deal. Yeah, maybe I could, I could just ask uh, if there's not, not a question right now. Um, can people who are on the call, can you raise or do the Raise your hand if you have been to Colombia before. Press star six to raise your hand. Yeah, interested to see how many or if anybody has, has been there before. I don't see any hands raised. Maybe no, no one has been. Uh, and what, what about just travel to Latin America in general? Was someone trying to ask a question, a 917 number? No, I was just raising my hand. Oh, where have you been? Um, Peru, Chile, and also in Central America. Great. And nobody else on, on, on the call? It looked like maybe there was someone else who raised their hand. I'm not sure if I can see it on this. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not seeing any. Well, then we have a lot of people who who would be their first time. Um, and uh, just among people who again who are who are on the call now, people who are interested in, in who are looking to to travel abroad in the next year or somewhere in, in the world, just to raise your hand, just so I get a sense. So on the phone, you can press star six to raise your hand. If you're on the computer, you can um, hit the word participants and then click the hand.
Gabriel, would you say that most people that go on your trips are newcomers to travel or most people have previously traveled to Colombia or to other places and this is just kind of one more trek on their journey? Um, I would say most people have interest from have experienced traveling somewhere, but I don't think we've had anyone that's been to the country they're traveling to uh, before. We wrong with that. For me, maybe that may be different for some of the shorter trips. The shorter trips is more focused on people who are already living there or working there or traveling there for a longer period of time. So they've obviously been there or planning to be there regardless. But for longer trips, not, not always the case. Um, and, and the trips, at least the longer ones right now, are really aimed at an, at an audience that is not an experienced traveler. And this, this is not like a, you know, intensive adventure trip. Um, physically speaking, it's not very demanding. The idea is really that it could be we have someone, uh, I think on this trip coming up in August, we have people who are, I think we have someone who is over 75, over 80. Uh, I can't remember now exact age, but, but she's not, not young, not a spring chicken anymore. Um, and the, the idea is that the trip really is accessible to people of all ages. Um, so right, right now it tends to be um, people who have a bit more time for traveling on longer trips. But the shorter trips, you have younger people, you have people of um, different kinds of backgrounds, um, and some of that is nice. I mean, there, there's definitely a benefit to having a group who all comes from one organization or one part of the world because they have an easier time sharing, understanding each other, as well as a much clearer uh, channel, I suppose, for advocacy once they return home because they're all coming back to the same place. But there's also something that's really nice about having people come from very different places, very different backgrounds, because they're meeting and sharing and learning not only with our partners, but amongst themselves as well as they're going through the, these trips. So both have their, their, their pros and their cons. Yeah, what I think really resonates with World Beyond War is what you were talking about earlier about how people are not just you know, observers taking photographs and then going back home and kind of forgetting about it, but that concept of really being inspired to go back to your home country and be an advocate and be an activist. And like you said, you know, talk to your representatives, wherever, whatever country you're in, and really, you know, become a peace builder in the way that you can. Um, and, you know, that's what we're trying to cultivate at World Beyond War with our global network of volunteers and activists starting chapters around the world working on these issues in their home countries. And so I think that's really the connection for us and, and the way that people can can see it, in, you know, in person and in Colombia and, and then hopefully be inspired to take action. Yeah, absolutely. And this is something I want to reflect. I mean, this is certainly, this relates to Colombia quite directly, um, but it really is, is a bit broader as well. Um, I was early this year and down in, in Washington, D.C., um, talking with some members of, uh, some staff members on, on, the, on the Hill in, in Congress um, about justice travel, about how they thought um, people who were coming back in these trips could play an effective advocacy role, particularly for members of Congress who are not always the most friendly to human rights. Um, and what they said was quite encouraging to me, which is really that there are some issues that at least this is, you know, this may be US specific, but I think it applies to other countries as well. There are issues which are really controversial and difficult. And you have thousands of people, constituents on each side weighing in, calling their representatives about one thing or the other. Those, those are hard for one person to have a big effect in. But when it comes to international relations, when it comes to um, places like Colombia particularly, where you certainly have advocacy, but it's not the same level as you might talk about a much more politically charged issue within the, the country. Um, in those kind of contexts, even one person, literally just one person going to representative and getting the ear of that person um, and saying, you know, I, it's just in this country and there's a serious problem um, in this part of the country or with this particular issue. And I really think that you should write a letter to, uh, to the Colombian government and the US State Department saying that we should focus more on these things. Sometimes even just that one person's request actually results in action being taken. It results in letters being written. It results in, in pressure being placed. Um, you know, it's, it's, it sounds sort of naive, but it's real. I mean, on issues like that, people respond to constituent requests. So I think that both for all issues that, that uh, World Beyond War works on, and particularly for, for our relationships with our partners in, in Colombia, it's really something that we focus on, is getting people to come back home um, and yeah, it's nice to go and, and, uh, and to have that within your own friend circle and share your experiences, but to reach beyond that as well, um, both to a general public and to your elected officials and to talk about your experiences. Because 
it's not very common. You know, most of the time people coming home from vacations don't go and talk to their congressman about what they saw there. And when it comes to these sort of groups, it is really important and it really can make a, can make a difference. Um, yeah, so I think that's, that's something that's, that's certainly we, we take into account when we think about how our impact uh, is played out over periods of time. But I think it's just, you know, it's applicable to all sorts of international relations issues. So um, that, yeah, I think that, that's something that, that uh, unites, I would say, justice travel and, and world beyond war and what we're trying to, to accomplish in our, our advocacy work. Well, thank you, Gabriel and Juan. Um, it's nine o'clock, so I want to be cognizant of time and let everyone go home. Um, you know, I'm going to unmute everyone um, to see if there are any last questions if people had problems raising their hands so I'm going to now now click unmute all um, and you can all ask your last question if you have one I have one please go ahead Hi, my name is Concetta I I was just I got on the call late I didn't hear the whole call but I was wondering about partners I'm um, um, I work with the School of the Americas, the SOA Watch, um, and also the Global Amer the Marino, um, they, they have trips also down to South America. I was just wondering if, if you mentioned partners that you work with. Yeah, absolutely. So, so in Colombia, we have uh, a really diverse and interesting set of partners, um, and Juan, tell me if I'm missing somebody, but uh, in, in and around Bogota, we work with a group called Prodemos el Dialogo, which is a second level civil society dialogue organization that's focused on the peace process, both around the FARC, uh, the past, and the current with the second, start, second largest rebel group, which is the ELN. And um, so that's, that's their main focus. Hola. In, in and around the Cali area, we work with both uh, ASIN, which is the Indigenous uh, Association of Indigenous Leaders in the north of Cauca. Um, and with Afro this, which is the... Well, uh, we had some, ah, okay. Um, yeah, that, that's around the Cali area. In Medellin, we work with the University of Antioquia, which is the biggest university in that... Uh, in that I think it's the biggest university, no, Juan, in, in the city? Mm. I'm saying that, yeah, it's... it's um, so them and particularly their, their social uh, community research program that they have there, um, which is focused on human violence. Uh, in, uh, in Santa Marta area and Tirona area, we work with a group called Camara Oscura, which is a collective, a creative collective uh, of young people in the area and um, who focus on cultural, uh, I probably should not the right word, cultural preservation, I suppose, in some way, and uh, as well as uh, kind of social issues in the area, particularly around the YU indigenous there and then in Cartagena we have a partner which is called FEM uh, who works uh, particularly with women in the informal and displaced group settlements around the city. Uh, am I missing anything one? Did I miss? Nothing? I Thank guess you. Uh, Museo Casa La Memoria as well like the, the museum in Medellin which focuses on the historical remembrance and they're not an activist group but they do a lot of advocacy work within Medellin particularly around people who are who suffer during the war. That's sort of yeah. We have some other groups who work with at a higher level, but those are the ones we work with on the trip itself. And we also meet with journalists and former government officials so that and they really know how things work within the system. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for, for all your work. No, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you, everyone, for joining. Thanks, Gabriel and Juan, for the presentations. Um, again, if you want to sign up for one of their tours or read more about their work, you can go to their website, which is simply the words justice.travel. And we'll send you a follow-up email with this information as well and a recording of this webinar if you want to watch it later or share it with your friends. Um, but thanks again, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.